I will start webinar now so people can join here. And is it is it okay for you that uh, after your talk we will make some Q and A? Sure, sure. For a few minutes. If, uh, let's see. Uh, if people there are, are usually questions or thoughts. Shy, but <laughs> maybe maybe we can continue for a few minutes. Let's see. Of course, yeah. I'm I'm also like by weather. Uh, I would like to take a nap. <laughs> but... yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, it's hot and humid. It's also humid now here, which is very yeah. strange because it used to be more arid and dry. And now because of this ongoing rain for weeks, it's super humid. <sighs> we have a first attendee. I will wait just a few minutes and I will let you know when I when we are going. Sure, no, I'm, I'm not in a hurry. Okay. Um, I will also need to share my screen at some point because I'm, yeah. I'm actually showing some I will, images. I think I need a permission, but should yeah, be. I will make you a host. No, uh, no, sorry. I make you host. You need to make make me host now because. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, how do I? Let's see. Uh, more next to my name. Wait a minute. More, yeah. Uh, make host. Okay. Um, <laughs> Oh, no, should works. Cool. I'm going live on Facebook slowly. Okay, we are live. I will wait now just for a few seconds and minutes and then we will start. <clears throat> Okay, I think we can start slowly. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome in the second talk of our series on intersectionality of climate crisis. Uh, I would like to welcome Alexandra Pirici. 
and Alexandra in her talks, in her talk, Ways of Spending Time, <clears throat> will speak about cultivating possibilities to sensible be in, move in, and shape a world in crisis, both symbolically and practically. We invited Alexandra Pirici to this series based on her performative works and her thinking and refers to nature. In the context of her works, Alexandra will take us through examples of more specific concern with the human body-mind, becoming other, using a practice of embodiment to get close to other life forms. She will then ponder on how artistic work that even through material and concrete keeps a focus on the symbolic can be combined with the very practical and necessary counterpart the work of planting, growing plants and vegetables, and reflect on how both thinking practices inform and balance each other. Alexandra Pirici is an artist with background in dance and choreography who works undisciplined across different mediums. Her works have been exhibited within the <clears throat> decennial art exhibition Sculptor Project Monster 2017, the Venice Biennial, Romanian Pavilion at the 55th edition, Tate Modern London, New Museum New York, Art Basel, Masselplatz, the 9th Berlin Biennial, Manifesta 10, Centre Pompidou Paris, Museum Ludwig Cohen, among many others. Alexandra Pirici works in museum context, theatrical frame, frameworks, and other, and other public space. She choreographs ongoing actions, performative monuments, and performative environments that fuse dance, sculpture, spoken word, and music. Her works deal with monumentality or the history of specific places and institution in order to playfully tackle and transform existing hierarchies. They also reflect on the history and function of gestures in art and popular, popular culture on questions about the body, its presence, absence, or image, and the politics of capture. Her performative artworks are part of private and public collections as live actions. And now I would like to uh, ask Alexandra to start her talk. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Peter, for the presentation, for the introduction, and for the invitation, of course. And Thank you all for joining, whoever has joined now. Um, I can imagine it's, a, you know, it's summer in most of places <laughs> that, are, uh, that the uh, participants come from, maybe. It's very hot. I was uh, saying this before, it's uh, super hot in Bucharest, where I am now, and I'm trying not to overuse the air conditioning. So I'm also a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm more slow. <laughs> I think it's fine that we let this become visible. Um, this is anyway going to be a very relaxed talk and actually more like a you know monologue. It's how I feel every time with these online lectures that you basically talk to yourself or to your image or talking to someone else who have the same feeling, you know, that you always, you don't know who's watching, you know, but anyway. Um, yes, I, I will try to, to, to do something like a very loose um, talk. Um, also because of the, of the topic, it's very broad. You know, that when we think about climate change and the intersectionality of the climate, the climate crisis. So I think I can actually just say a couple of things about how I think about, um, how I think about it or, or the, the multiplicity of crisis um, and the multiplicity of changes that we're facing and how I think we can think about it. And it's interesting to think about it and how we can maybe, uh, what can actually help us go through it or through this time because I think there is a way out really. So I don't think we can go get out of it. It's, um, I think we talk about a process that you know, is now underway and we're going to, to, to be going through this most of our lives for sure, um, uh, or throughout our lives. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I, I just want to maybe go through some key concepts and practices that can be helpful in this time or are helpful for me. And I wanna start with the first word 
um, which is uh, ongoingness. Actually, I would like to maybe share my screen just that uh, it also gives me a different perspective. So if it's fine with you, I will, uh, I will start doing this. Uh, one second. No, 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 no. I don't want to say. I would like just to add that people can ask questions here on Q and A column on Zoom or uh, via Facebook. So. Sure, and I'm happy to to reply to them or discuss more at the end. Um, so um, I want to start with this first word, uh, ongoingness. Um, because this situation, when we speak about climate change and uh, climate emergency, is actually something that is here to stay. And as I mentioned, I think we we will live through this and many generations after us. And it's it's not, you know, it's not a matter of fashion or a season uh, or a topic that will be exhausted and will go go away after a couple of years. Um, so it, it's also a question of how to keep going, and I think how to keep our attention uh, on this. Um, uh, so how to bear with it and to avoid a kind of fatigue with the subject. And I'm saying this also uh, because I, I myself sense or feel sometimes this fatigue. Um, I think it comes uh, in general, um, also from, especially in the art world, but in the world at large. While we, of course, acknowledge there are many um, any deniers of climate change, but I think in general, you know, especially for people who have accepted it, it, it keeps, it, it is in, on our minds uh, in different ways. And especially in the art world, I think, you know, everyone more or less tries to address this. And so there are myriad projects and exhibitions and, and, and events that deal with this. Um, and I think, yeah, that we can easily get tired by it. And I think this comes from a superficiality of attention um, how, how, how we are trained to pay attention to things, um, also within what we call the cultural world. I think because of on competition, you know, we're, we're trained to, to immediately discard something as old or, okay, that's been done. We've been, we talked about that. There have been three exhibitions about that. So how, so the question is, how do we keep attention on this topic also? And then I think we talk about the superficiality of approach, um, and treatment of the topic which again is, is I think part of how um, um, a large part of the art world function because it functions in this logic of keywords and trends and, and subjects that are trendy in uh, one season and then they go out uh, in the next. Then I think we really need to, to think about these topics and, and the other topics and this, this, this um, uh, multiple subjects that relate to this crisis for a long time and long term. And so we, we, we need, I think, to think uh, with this word of on, ongoingness rather than within this dichotomy of the old and the new. Uh, so to do away with this old new uh, combo in favor of continuity and of persistence and of relationality. Um, and why I was also drawn to this word, I think also um, Donna Haraway uses it, but um, oh, let me. Uh, move to, to this other image. Um, this is an image from an, an ongoing action, which is how most of my works, uh, my performative works have actually been called. Um, the ongoing action is actually the work that I made together with Manuel Pelmush for the Romanian Pavilion in 2013, uh, which was in Venice. At the Venice Biennale it was curated by Raluca Voina. And I, I remember our discussions back then with Raluca mostly um, because we wanted to avoid uh, the eventfulness of the word performance and the, the, the way in which you can think about it in, as a short term, something short term. So we really thought about how, we, how do we call this performative work you know, that doesn't have a traditional dramaturgy um, or a linear narrative, and that, but that persists for. for six months uh, in the context of that exhibition. And so that persists by repetition, but it's always repetition with a difference. And that is dependent or its meaning also depends on each visitor that experiences it. And we called it an ongoing action. Um, and since then I've been describing a lot of my works as ongoing actions, again, to somehow insist on this 
uh, idea of, of something that persists through repetition rather than a one-time event, a one-time spectacle. Um, uh, uh, so just to also, um, and also why I chose this image, I uh, am um, to link to, to this interest in ongoingness. And also because it's an enactment of a drawing depicting two tigers um, that was presented in the Japanese room uh, at what was then called the International Art Exhibition, so before the Venice Biennial, um, uh, in 1924. Uh, so the work uh, that, that we showed in the Profina and this immaterial retrospective of Venice Biennale basically uh, produced uh, and embodied a performative retrospective of the history of, of the Venice Biennial. And this is one of the first um, enactments that also related somehow to uh, other life forms. Um, so I also wanted to introduce uh, again <laughs> this uh, this uh, this let's say this performative strategy or this this concept of enactment and of embodiment, which actually uh, it's it's all about trying to become other, you know, trying to become something other than human and something other than yourself. And it's not necessarily through a, let's say, theatrical approach, but rather through a formal. Again, if you don't think in terms of mind, body, uh, it's, it's kind of the same thing. But let's say that it's about placing your body in a situation and then seeing how that changes your emotion and, um, and how this changes something also in your attitude. Um, and this was not the first time that I was interested in this practice. These are images from um, uh, one uh, work in a series of works that were public space interventions and sculptural additions to public monuments in Bucharest, uh, where, um, yeah, in this particular uh, uh, situation, we were embodying, trying to embody the horse. So to, to think about, uh, um, you know, to, 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 to unpack a little bit this representation, this desirable representation of power and control and governance in the end within this equestrian statue that, that always presents this human on top of an animal, kind of dominating this animal and then see how this, um, how, what does this say about concepts such as citizenship, you know, and again, human and animal and so on. Uh, we, I had a very, let's say also, also different interests back then, but um, yeah, this is just to, to somehow connect also to this practice of embodiment. This was in 2011 even, so almost a decade ago. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and somehow I think that, that uh, I'm still interested, I'm still very much interested in this practice, which is, is material and both symbolic in a way. Of, of coming close to, to something other than yourself. And of course, um, I also want to keep this, I think, as an important uh, idea or concept, how, how to become other than who we thought we are um, and other than this traditional understanding of the human that is, you know, on two legs and always sees the world from a certain perspective and so on. Um, and yeah, just to quickly, Go back to ongoingness. I'm just uh, using this image of these roots that are even within this grid. Uh, you know, they they repeat the grid, but with a difference, and they find uh, ways to distort it a little bit because they had to grow within these shapes. But to so to go back to ongoingness, I also wanted to link this word uh, to our attitude towards this crisis unfolding on multiple levels at, mu at multiple scales, uh, which is what we describe as climate change or climate breakdown. Um, and I've recently, uh, uh, I was recommended this paper. Um, I think I can send to it, but I think it hasn't been published yet. So it's a it's kind of a weird uh, text. It's up on the author's website, but I'm not sure it's in its best form, but nevertheless, I found some ideas that are interesting there. And I can connect to it. It's called Against Crisis Epistemology by Kylie White. Um, and why I thought that was interesting, because besides other things, um, it, it, it is a warning or it, go, it, it positions itself against um, colonial models of reacting to the crisis. Uh, you know, and somehow there is this idea that because something is urgent and, 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 and acute and, and serious, 
uh, the de decisions about it and how to uh, respond to it and the solutions have to be very fast and decisive and and um, and, and, and usually easily scalable if we speak about solutions uh, and the the paper basically says that it's also informed by uh, uh, by um, more uh, more by indigenous intellectual traditions and 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 pauses this epistemology of coordination against this epistemology of crisis which again uh, thinks the word in colonial terms and you know claims to know what the solution is to the problem and to act from this singular power and, and again to to come up with this fast one size all um kind of a rushed uh, and, and mega plans for, for responding to what is in fact a very complex and, and diverse crisis. Um, and this, what, what Wyatt calls this epistemology of coordination, and I think it's also an interesting word, it's, um, um, it's referring actually to ways of knowing the world that emphasize the importance of kinship, of relation and moral bonds for generating the responsible capacity to respond to constant change. And again, I think this is interesting. So we're not talking about a crisis, like one thing, it, but we're talking about something that is constantly changing that we can't actually predict or even you know, accurately model. And we, you know, that, that needs actually a politics of coordination and coordinating responses rather than, again, the big man with a master plan. Um, and I'm, um, this, um, other image is a moment from another work, it's a large scale work, which has, I think, very interesting dynamics and it's on an ongoing negotiation between performance. Actually, it's called Aggregate. And this is an image from his first installation at the Neue Berliner Kunstverein where performers practice and they embody uh, this ocean eels colony. And what was interesting, what's interesting about the eels these colonies of wheels is that they are informed, their movement is informed by both the water, so the, the moving, the movement of the waves and, and each other's movement. So there's, it's a way of negotiating where to turn your attention and how to, to respond to your surrounding as well. Uh, so again, I want to, I want to, to maybe keep this idea that a, a possible, or I think, a desirable response to this crisis is about coordinating uh, different solutions and responsible uh, and responses in a careful and not no not rushed way, um, which means setting up networks of entities to coordinate, and they can be, of course, individuals, communities, institutions, all sorts of apparatuses, even nation states, or all sorts of of other uh, constructions, as long as they are. Um, they are in the game, right? but it means that that these all need some underlying values, um, and I think that's also important. And we need to somehow agree also on what do we want to say, like what what is the human, or what what is human <laughs> about us, so or what 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 do we understand by this, and uh, and then how do we want to survive as what and and what for, and also who feels involved into this action conversation. <clears throat> and, and again, that this conversation is of course, not just between us, which was already a mess, <laughs> but it's a conversation too. And it's a negotiation with, with other, uh, other life forms as well. So I think it's also important to, to, to think about an attitude to climate change as this double movement. So on one hand, um, how to, to, you know, I think we need to acknowledge the urgency and the, the reality of this, these crises. Uh, and of course, I also always have the sense that it's too little too late, that everything is late already, but then also how not this realization, not to trigger, I think, rushed decisions and, and not, to, not to become desperate, you know, to, to make very abrupt and to, very abrupt decisions and to go for, for these fast techno fixes or easily scalable solutions. Um, this sort of bull in the China shop kind of thing, which inevitably backfired and then, uh, yeah, there's just more to, to, to react to. Um, so how to realize, how to accept this and also how not to rush to respond, but also how not to be paralyzed. 
Um, and I, I think in a way art and gardening, <laughs> you know, can help us think, do things uh, in this way or think through the crisis, this, these crises like this, uh, because they're offering something valuable, I think, in both concrete uh, and symbolic ways. Um, and again, I'm talking from a very personal uh, you know, perspective. I'm an artist also. Um, so I also very much like art as much as I hate the art world a lot of times or whatever parts of it. I don't, you know, those that, that maybe take center stage the most and, and the way in which they, or in which it reflects uh, all the problems and the toxicity in society at large. But I still think there's there's uh, there's a lot to discover and with each other also within this uh, this small world. So why art? I think of course because uh, we do need to become other um, and 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 to 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 find pleasure in different things and to uh, to become sensible to to things other than than what we what we enjoyed or what we enjoy now. Um, and art is about sensibilization uh, and becoming sensible too, becoming sensible to the world in, in, in different ways. Uh, and why gardening is also because I think we need to, we need this relation to the concrete. Um, and actually I, I, I wanted to bring this image of quite interesting image from a, from a film, I have some images from some films also later, uh, but this is an image I can't show because I think the film only screened a couple of times at some festivals and also very briefly online. It's called, the movie is called, it's not a burial, this is not a burial, it's a resurrection. It's a movie by Lemohang Jeremiah Mosese and it depicts this village, this African village. Um, well, and the a main character that struggles with all sorts of problems within this environment, but there's this image of um, uh, working the land. I think it's called plowing. plowing. Oh, I forgot to look this up on Google before. <laughs> so my English is um, sometimes with very specific terms, but I think working the land, you know, to make it ready for planting with these oxes, it, it's a very hard labor. To, um, in rural areas in Romania, I think people still do this also. It's very hard. So it's, there's nothing to necessarily romanticize about it. Um, uh, and it's very, you know, it's uh, very goal oriented. You need to do this. This is something that in, you don't really derive any pleasure from it, but you're, you're, this is how you get food. This is how you're able to sustain yourself in the end. And what was interesting about this image in this movie, this sequence is that uh, besides the pe people laboring the land, there's this whole choir and group of people singing and even moving, dancing around it. So there's this combination of, of, uh, of pleasure and, 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 and hard labor. Uh, and of these two spheres somehow brought together you know, art, the art and, 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 and laboring the land and, and gardening, planting something that it, it's, it, it makes for a really beautiful way of spending time actually. And if you think about rotating, this sort of activities, you know, perhaps we can think about gardening and working with land and with soil, not necessarily as this, uh, you know, in this logic of very uh, stark divisions of labor and knowledge where this part is dedicated to work, 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 and someone has to do it in the end or uh, something is doing it. Um, and we take our pleasure and we, 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 we uh, find our enjoyment somewhere else. So. Uh, I think we, I think we can combine these two these two activities in very interesting and meaningful ways, and they can actually inform each other. And also, why gardening? I think we really need to, let's say, to act against this total uh, dependence uh, on big, mostly market-driven uh, and very abstract systems of sustaining life that are actually increasingly volatile. And, and in fact, I think. Uh, breaking down um, and I don't know how to explain this very uh, very well but let's say that uh, 
I think we need to work against these very stark divisions in, of labor and the divisions of knowledge that have been amplified, of course, with modernity and industrialization. Um, and I, I also, I, 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 I see this also when, when I talk or and I interact also with some relatives that still live in the countryside, there was this, uh, there's, and it's still there, this idea that uh, physical labor, you know, that working with your hands in the soil uh, is to be looked down upon. It's not as valuable, it's not as interesting, it's not going to earn you as much as more abstract intellectual labor. So a higher order of, uh, of thinking, doing, let's say. It's also, of course, something that depends on this division between the body and the mind and the intellect and physical activity, which is very wrong um, but there's a sense of 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 value being attributed to uh work that is increasingly abstract increasingly immaterial and when in fact is very material everything is very material um but i feel we are especially us when we speak about the cultural world and a lot of us have been incentivized and 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 told that this is actually even by our grandparents and by you know this is what's going to get you you know in a good position and uh, an increasingly abstract labor, in fact. And I think that we are trading these abstract and symbolic themes, which of course, again, they are material, they have material consequences, but it's not what we're emphasizing on and it's not how they are valued mostly. Like uh, also texts, exhibitions, uh, you know, um, computer code, uh, all sorts of things, right? But they were trading this for another abstraction, which is money, which is of course increasingly abstract, and which of course of which we are less and less because we know, you know, unprecedented inequality, unprecedented concentration of wealth at the top means more and more labor for less and less money when you have less and less redistribution of resources. And then there's this, so this other abstraction is supposed to guarantee um, the, the possibility to acquire, so for you to purchase those things that are actually very concrete and, and, and somehow they should be there. So they should not be acquired, <laughs> they should be given. And we speak about you know, food and speak about good food, tasty food. We were talking a little bit before uh, starting the recording about the taste of tomatoes. Those of us who still remember, <laughs> it sounds a little bit like it's a dystopian movie, the taste of homegrown tomatoes, which you cannot find in the shop actually. So tasty food, uh, clean water, clean air, clean land, these are all very concrete things. Uh, so I think we need to break this circle of this dependence, this exclusive total dependence on the system of abstractions that is, is increasingly failing actually to even get us those, those things, you know, we, we increasingly fail to even be able to purchase, which is also very problematic, clean water, clean air and, and good food and shelter and not to mention, you know, nice surrounding. Um, so to, to put it very, uh, uh, you know, very, Bluntly, I think we need to take to reclaim land. <laughs> I'm sorry, maybe it sounds a little bit strange, but I, I think that those of us who have the possibility to organize in any way to acquire, because in the end we live in a system that still uh, is still all about property, but to to reclaim and to reacquire land, it's also something that is important to do, besides obviously also occupying and insisting on, on common spaces. Um, and it, I, again, when we come back to gardening, so I, I really think we need to learn how to grow food and, and not, not to become independent. This is also a bit of an illusion, but to understand what this means and, and to, to have this very concrete outcome out of uh, out of your labor and out of your energy placed into something of course in relation to the abstract and the symbolic and um, i think it's also interesting uh, with the 
uh, with the, the pandemic and the series of lockdowns, because everything, you know, when it came to governance and, 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 and businesses and bosses, you know, and, and schools and universities, everything was about going online, you know, so digitalization, it's still, you know, it's main priority for the European Union's Green Deal, right? So the greening, with digitalization, of course you need digitalization, but how, where, when, why, it, this is a whole, a whole issue and it's not necessarily green either, you know, um, but everybody, you know, though the, the plan was and the proposal was to go online and to stay connected online, actually everybody felt, or at least in our, not just in, I think in our bubbles, also outside of these bubbles, from what I could tell from direct and indirect, uh, interactions a lot of people actually started gardening and started planting things and we literally you know <laughs> putting your hands in the earth and and working and 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 spending time with this other life forms this green things you know that, that grow and you see them grow and 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 they uh yeah they make you feel <laughs> so well and as if things actually have a purpose um so, so again, I, I think this is, this is super important and it, it's, it's something that we, we all need to do in however ways we can, wherever we can at the moment. I also think gardening um, implies, it's a very good practice uh, if you think in terms of negotiating space, life, purpose. I mean, even very, very, uh, you know, a very simple tomato pruning basically teaches you that you negotiate purpose with the plant. Um, uh, I'm maybe showing just some changing the images a bit. I'm going to show some images of artworks and gardening, <laughs> uh, whatever I could uh, actually grow something um, in the, you know, 60 square meters of the city apartment. Uh, uh, but I think again, so when, when it comes to, to gardening, uh, it really teaches you how, how, there's, how you always interfere with nature. So there's no purity in that and there's no romantic way of thinking about nature, which is sometimes I think the, uh, there's a danger in that again, and a privilege in that and thinking that you, 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 you just have to stay away. You know, you ha we have to preserve something that is untouched. That, that, that is a compromise, in fact. It's a compromise when you, your second nature kind of takes over everything of nature, of wild nature, like national parks. They are great, but within a compromising world where you don't actually live with nature, you live completely removed from it and then, you, 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 you think there, there, there is wilderness or there, there is some purity there. I think we need to accept that we interfere. We always interfere. We have always interfered. And then the question gets more com complex, like how, why, when, how, and how, how, how careful this interfering with must be and how, how much you can negotiate. With the pruning, you obviously negotiate purpose with the plant because the plant, especially um, I think when it comes with, to these tomatoes with an indeterminate growth, the, the, the plant actually wants to spread as much as possible and to take up as much space as possible and to become bushy. And actually you want it to grow tomatoes, <laughs> so to, to a little bit more tomatoes. So you kind of have to keep cutting it and to keep removing the, the I think it's called suckers. In, in Romanian, it's very interesting because the word for, I think, sucker, like the, the, the little shoot, is, uh, is actually the same as the one for child. So you say copil. So you, you have to remove the children. <laughs> That's terrible. It, the plural is not similar, thank God, but you, you, you keep thinking about this, you know, right, this working with the body of, of the plant and, and negotiating with it. With with her, with you know, <laughs> to to call it, to call the plant. Um, so I think it, it's great uh, hands-on practice of negotiation. Uh, and the, the the images are from a work called Recollection, um, and from, from my apartment, our apartment that I share with my partner, where we tried to grow this climbing beans. Um, this is another image from uh, Aggregate, which is like, a large-scale performative environment with um, 
humans taking roots, becoming trees, um, thinking about roots and mangrove trees also. And this is an image of uh, one of our tomato plants that you know, we keep pruning and it keeps escaping our, <laughs> it keeps, keeps uh, outsmarting us in, in growing, uh, growing very, very large. Uh, ah, yeah, no, I want to stay with this actually before introducing somehow the next image. Um, and, and another another concept that I think it's really important to take into account because it shapes who we are and it it helps us again become other is the, the concept of psychogeography. Uh, I don't think we're we're talking about enough. So basically how geography and everything around us, architecture and the space around us shapes uh, our emotions and our behaviors. And I think we all actually, we, we, we felt this very, very clearly during the lockdown and especially people in the cities, you know, in, in, in these little boxes uh, when you couldn't go out and also when you couldn't socialize and when there was no more culture. Um, I was also talking with another artist friend and they're saying, you know, you actually realize the city is, you know, obsolete. Like, why would you? Why would you live in these urban agglomerations? Why would you keep thinking in this, again, uh, a dual thing where you have the, you know, the urban and the rural and, uh, you know, the urban is where things happen. And then the rural is either this leisure space, this kind of bucolic, idyllic retreat for the wealthy, or it's, uh, you know, it's completely... Uh, precarious and a complete disaster or it's, it's becoming a little bit energy farm for the cities so I definitely think we should we should change uh, how we think about space and, and live livable space and and, and land um, and I think again uh, art works and projects should also take us take us out and take us on on these moving experiences throughout different spaces. Um, and I'm definitely looking forward, also thinking how to work artistically. I, I, I have to say, I, I, I also, I still enjoy the white cube and I still enjoy working with the museum spaces, but I think we should also, you know, rather than bring na nature in, uh, I think we can also take, you know, culture, this, or different kind of culture out and, and expand and, and, and think about um, art as happening in many other places. And again, not only in urban centers. Um, and and I, I also why I, I, I think you know, the gardens and forests and other art spaces are important is because we actually, uh, again, also because now we are here, but we, we really need to move. This is how we actually know the world. We, initially know the world by moving uh, it's all you know the an active approach to perception and this um, embodied perception I mean, even more contemporary strands of cognitive science uh, have accepted that that this is how we actually know the world that we are able for example to form the concept and the image of a table and to use this concept because we're actually we have been able to move around the table and to, to feel its hardness and to understand its edges. So it's not vision, it is movement um, that help us, helps us know, know the world. Uh, uh, and, and so again, I think we need to move through very different spaces and through these spaces that, that have a very different or enable a different psychogeography um, than the, that than the, the, the city space or the urban space and I, I wanted to uh, to and then I'm, I'm uh, also close to to an end let's say but I wanted to bring in these two um, actually three works uh, this is an image from this movie of Konchalovsky it's called Siberia uh, very interesting film I definitely recommend it actually uh, it tells the story of 100 years uh, and of this of changes in this region in the Siberian village 
um, going through the, the Russian revolutions and then and again the, the beginning of industrialization and the exploitation of oil in some um, marshlands near to this village and and it's it's full of uh, it addresses many things. There's also this um, uh, old man who is called the eternal old man in this forest. Also the kind of Christian, which is I think the a bit of a problem when the way it's it's depicted in the movie it's not a perfect film but i think it's interesting nevertheless uh who lives in the forest together with his animals and has this almost supernatural uh, uh capacities to heal some animals and but there's also this man uh who wants to actually get out of the forest and we speak about the siberian taiga and at the beginning of the 20th century right so just woods uh, and this man kind of cuts trees every day. This is what he does. It's kind of a, so there's this obsessive uh, thing with getting out of the forest and cutting, cutting a road uh, through the forest and through the taiga, which looks like this uh, towards the end. So this kind of straight line, kind of cutting, uh, separating this space of, of, uh, of darkness also. And you see this light. <laughs> at the end of opening up in front of you. Uh, and this is the son of this man. I'm looking into this distance, into this straight road opened up uh, in this immensity of the forest. Um, you know, if we think about again, the psychogeography of the, the modern world also, and what sort of, image of progress and a future we had. And from this, I, I wanted to, to move to this excerpt from a book by Ursula Le Guin, Ursula Le Guin which is called The Word for World is Forest. It's also written in the 70s, in the Konchalovsky's movie is also late 70s, I think. And, uh, Lagoon's book describes this other planet, uh, which is all forest, so it hasn't been deforested, uh, deforestated yet, and it's invaded by 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 uh, humans from Earth. And I just wanted to read. I want us to read through this description of this space and think about its psychogeography. No way was clear, no light unbroken in the forest. Into wind, water, sunlight, starlight, there always entered leaf and branch, bowl and root, the shadowy, the complex. Little paths ran under the branches, around the bowls, over the roots. They did not go straight, but yielded to every obstacle devious as nerves. The ground was not dry and solid, but damp and rather springy, product of the collaboration of living things with the long elaborate death of leaves and trees. And from that rich graveyard grew 90 foot trees and tiny mushrooms that sprouted in circles half an inch across. The smell of the air was subtle, various and sweet. The view was never long, unless looking up through the branches, you caught sight of the stars. Nothing was pure, dry, arid, plain. Revelation was lacking. There was no seeing everything at once, no certainty. The colors of rust and sunset kept changing in the hanging leaves of the copper willows. And you could not even say whether the leaves of the willows were brownish red or reddish green or green. Um, and so the question I think is how to negotiate between straight lines and sinuous uh, trajectories you know, of meandering routes and, and changing circumstances and changing potential solutions to ever changing uh, problems. Um, and I, I want to end actually with this text, which I'm not gonna read, but maybe uh, if you are interested, you can 
uh, you can read it on your own. It's not, I'm not <laughs> I'm advertising Eflex, actually, I don't care. But this is, this is a, a really beautiful text written now uh, by Raluca Voina, which is called Countryside Roads. And I think it bridges together, if you think about this open road, this straight line uh, in the Siberian movie, and then this forest where nothing is pure, there's no clear, straight uh, view. Um, and, and then Raluca's text, I think, uh, yeah, uh, this would actually be a nice, uh, nice ending or after ending. It's a text about art and communities and, and gardening and the future, mm, you know, uh, as much as it's, it's up to us. Um, so I think I'm, I'm going to end with this. I'm going to pause here, if that's all right. And I'm happy to respond to any questions or to discuss further. Maybe I'm going to stop. Yeah, thank you very much, Alexandra, for, for the talk. It was really interesting to hear your thoughts on, on, on this. Uh, and I would like to tell people that they still still can ask questions here in q a column or on a, on a facebook in the comments and yeah maybe i will start with the with the first question um also re regarding what you were saying about the gardening during the lockdown and regarding your practice if you thought also uh how how people can start working with their bodies during the lockdown, jogging, uh, running, uh, or going on bike walks and so on. And if you um, if, if you if you also was thinking about this regarding mental health and also also the gardening, uh, if if these practices uh, help us keep keep sane during lockdown and what are your thoughts on on this maybe yeah no for sure again i i don't really see i think mental health is very much connected to the body it's it's not very literal in the sense that you know you ache in your body when when you feel that you have a psychological burden but but everything is connected. And this is also why I'm using this term, the body mind, because I don't want to make a distinction between, you know, our mind, what is the mind? Even the brain, you know, that cognition is not happening in the brain alone. Um, and, and there's no, I don't think there's such a clear separation, you know, between cognition and affect. And so it, it's, a, it, it's all actually, we need to think about everything together. And I think when you, we think about mental health, we also think about how we move, where we move and how we are able to, uh, again, to, to use our bodies and, and to move in and out of these situations of stress and also how we, how we relax, not just our mind, but our bodies and, and how we move. And, and this is also, I mean, the, the, we talk about chemistry then, you know, when that uh, physical effort releases, uh, you know, certain chemical components in your body, which make you feel better and so on. So it, it, it exert, but I think, to be honest, I, I, I'm also not very fond of this concept of exercise. It's very much, again, um, I think predicated upon these distinctions where, you know, it, it's also very modern, standardizable way of living. Most of people sitting at the office eight hours per day, and then they take time to exercise, you know, for two hours. I, and I think, I mean, it's great because in, in the end, if we don't have the time and possibility to do something else, that's fine. But... Uh, but we shouldn't be maybe sitting at a desk you know, for, for eight hours continuously. Maybe this, and then and then exercise and exercise in this way. Um, so uh, gardening definitely also makes you move differently, and it's hard. Like you need to to get lower down, and you need to use your joints, and you need to go under the plants. I, I or at least I might like to do that. And I think I know also from my grandmother that. 
uh, also people as they grow old they in a way they have a difficulty with with tending to to, to large uh, gardens it's important because it also makes you move differently and not to mention it's contact you know touch and contact with soil and uh, the texture of soil and then literally contact with plants the smell of plants and so it, it's a whole it's a whole environment that we get in touch with and that we spend time with um but also, of course, I, I really think it's important to move differently. Um, Raluca's text also mentions this other project that I didn't want to speak about because I spoke about it before and somehow, uh, which was called Observing Through Embodiment. It's a research, research project that I started and within it, I'm putting together, I'm initiating this encyclopedia of relations between plants. And I'm finding where uh, I've worked with uh, two other performers and we are finding um, uh, choreographies that could translate plant dynamics and relations between plants and plant movement. And I mean, I think we can find all sorts of practices, all sorts of corporeal movement practices that also don't tend to be so, uh, you know, standardized, like, like gym work, which is also, you know, it's also everything moves by turn. Now you do this, now you do sit-ups, now you do push-ups. So it's it's also very divided. There's no integrated uh, movement of the body. If I were to recommend a practice, I would recommend Tai Chi for sure. I think <laughs> you move in a more integrated, more interesting way. Uh, but, you know, it's also harder. It requires, I guess, it's not harder actually, but it requires more time and someone to teach it and, and so on. So different interest. Uh, but just to, to, to be, to conclude, definitely the health of the body mind uh, it's, 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 it's very much related to, to what, what we're doing. Yeah, it's, it's funny that you're mentioning Tai Chi. I, I, I wanted to start doing Tai Chi during the lockdown and, and I started a bit. And uh, when I spoke with, with some teachers, uh, obviously they was doing it only online, but they, they told me that it was high demand during the lockdown of, of Tai Chi. I think it's because the people starting to get to be aware of, of body mind, actually, that, uh, mm -hmm. that of course, that uh, uh, many people buy expensive running shoes, bicycles and so on. And, the, our our system trying to monetize all of this that we we have been in in lockdowns and so on but i think many people started to be aware of of the connection or 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 that our our mind is not separated from our bodies mm -hmm. and and uh, uh, as you as you said about the, how how people needed to put the hands into the soil and it was not just the gardening it was also the making home uh, making bread at home putting hands to to dough uh or uh i also went to some uh ceramic classes during during the lockdown and and the, the woman who was teaching the classes told me that also that many people called her that they would like to start doing with something with clay and clay is it's also earth do mm -hmm. uh soil a clay everything it's uh like there is a that people needed to it, it was some some inner inner sense that uh now it, which navigate people to that these uh exercises or practices uh mm -hmm. connecting us not just with earth but also with ourselves like more there is something deep in this and and uh, i think the the lockdowns and covid somehow the make people aware of this mm -hmm. maybe more intuitively not yeah. i think basically to those of us who could afford not to get panicked, not to panic too much. I think what it actually gave us was time. Like we, we stopped being so busy doing things and we actually, I think, were forced all of a sudden to have time or take time to see what is it that we're doing or like where we are, what, what, what do we need? Uh, I think we, we haven't been kept that busy. I mean, we have been in a way, I think, 
again, different levels of privilege afforded different people, different reactions to this. But uh, I think those of us who were not or could not afford or, or were able not to panic, like, what am I doing? I need to go. And of course, we, we still worked, but uh, we could take a little bit of time to, to time off. I think, uh, yeah, it, it sort of forces this pause kind of forced us to to actually look at where we are and what we are doing, um, which is, is good. I think it's great, but it's also a bit scary because <laughs> um, you realize, you know, and what is it that 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 is happening? What, what have we been putting all this energy into and what are we missing? And what why have we why are we being kept busy by things that we don't actually enjoy doing? And why don't we have time to do those things that we actually enjoy? And then what's the trade off? And then, yeah. And we don't want to do it. And we, we would yeah. like to uh, <laughs> like gardening and putting yeah. our hands to to soil and do and, and maybe and also be, i mean maybe this is also sustainable practice again i don't have this illusion of you know going off grid completely and now i'm going to eat only what i can grow it's difficult now we speak about to speak about climate change we speak about an environment that has changed completely you know with with diseases and with pathogens that did not exist 50 years ago when my grandparents were you know eating from their garden now i don't know what hit this plant you know what i like uh, yeah we've breeded also all sorts of new uh, very dangerous <laughs> things and but nevertheless i think it's uh, it's super important to to continue and to find solutions and to yeah, to also work with uh with plants and food yeah we, we have a one question uh on the facebook uh and then would like to <laughs> would like to ask uh, about the political behind the gardening for you. The, the political behind the gardening, just yeah, like it's. Well, I mean, uh, I think there are many levels on which we can talk about that. Uh, one, I think I've already mentioned this negotiating with the plants, so realizing that you work with nature and you interfere. So there's no uh, purity, there's no, uh, uh, yeah, there's no possibility to not interfere uh, actually. And we live off life also and off living things. Um, the other, I mean, I, I really, I, I, what, another thing that I noticed was the proliferation of community gardens and even urban gardens. And I think, I think they, they're also spaces that maybe coagulate or, or bring people together and, and make them negotiate space and time. Um, I, I, um, I also know, and, and again, this text that I recommended at the end, it's very much about that. It's a basically, it's both, a, it's about an art space, but also a community gardening project and an, um, an art project and a community living. So, um, you know, if we think about permaculture also, we also think about diverse existence and again, negotiating different ways of fighting, finding ways to live together when you see how plants can actually live together and how you can grow things uh, on this permaculture model that, that is possible to coexist. And you don't need, again, sort of rough solutions, this, um, uh, you know, pesticides. You can actually, if you have take time and you know how to treat things and what to plant together with what, and, and then what also what sort of insects you want to attract to, 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 to keep out these other insects and then how plants grow together. You have, for example, this um, famous uh, example of the three sisters, these three plants that are usually grown together. The, I think you have uh, climbing beans and, and uh, corn and, uh, and pum pumpkin, pumpkin, yes, I think so, which provide all sorts of benefits to each other. So you, if you grow them together, you have all chances to, to have all of them healthy and, and thriving. Uh, and I think we, we can take, or there's much to learn from permaculture and from how plants grow together and how we can find ways to, to live together and how these spaces and gardens bring people together to do something in common and to then also share resources. I think there's also this sense of sharing or at least I, I, I had this feeling always uh, uh, also with, relatives in the countryside they'd actually like to share 
at least on a small level, on a small scale. <laughs> I don't know. Like the, all these products and things that they, 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 they grow in the garden, there's a sense of sharing, you know, people bring this and then they gift you this. And um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm not sure if that. And of course, then there's this whole uh, thing about monoculture and permaculture and how monocultures are not sustainable. Neither large scale, I think industrial agriculture is sustainable anymore. Uh, so gardening is actually, I think, a way also through this crisis of land and, and uh, uh, food production. And I hope that answered the question. <laughs> and I think I think it's it's there is a difference when we are uh, planting tomatoes and if Jeff Bezos would start uh, <laughs> start gardening. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. yeah there is. A, mm, I, I I think it's interesting what you said that uh, that mm, it's it's not possible to not interfere with, with the nature and and just we need to be aware of this that uh, when when we are like planting tomatoes or gardening in our gardens, like be aware of it. We'll, like uh, be respectful to, to to the garden and the nature, and if we are doing in in, in that scale, and what does, what does it mean if we we would do it in in much bigger scale and and so on? And just I mean, the question of scale is important, and it's a big discussion around that. I I I, I don't believe in you know in. I mean, I think, of course, uh, if we talk about uh, very straightforward uh, policies, like, uh, I don't know, the minimum wage, you know, of course, yes, I think, uh, you know, this sort of large scale political solutions should be fought for and implemented, but they're not going to change. I mean, everything is a lot more convoluted yes. and complicated and, yeah. Yeah, but I think we, we discuss at, at least some some piece of it um, yeah i think we can we can wrap it up here yes uh, about there are not more questions but th thank you for watching us uh thank you very much alexandra for for your talk and and discussion thanks was, for the invitation it was a pleasure. thanks it was a pleasure too i hope we yeah we stay in touch anyway for sure okay have a, have nice a good day. evening <laughs> bye yeah. bye